How you doing? I'm Paul Biancardi, and I'm chopping it up with my man, Buck. We're here with Paul Biancardi on Chopping It Up with Buck this episode. It's been good. Coach B and I used to sit in the ESPNU studio and just talk ball. He knew I loved basketball, but he loved football just as much as I love basketball. So we've been trying to do this for a while. Glad to have you on. How you been, man? Buck, I've been great. And it's so good yeah. to see you and hear your voice. Yeah. And I can't wait to chop it up with you. <laughs> so you're already doing the commercial for us from the very beginning. So I want to just dive right into it. You grew up with a single mom. She worked multiple jobs. Mine did the same thing, too. You played in the CYO League. I was one of those guys growing up as Catholic and uh, played in, in CYO ball, but, you know, transitioned to Pop Warner and everything else. Tell us about your experience growing up in Boston and how that was when your mom and dad eventually divorced when you were seven. Uh, all those things that happened for you as a young, yeah, young kid. Yeah, it was a lot. And um, basketball was the saving grace because it was the sport – that I ended up falling in love with. As a young kid growing up in the city of Boston, I played all sports. Uh, baseball, I tried football, but that didn't last long. Uh, we would play a game called street hockey. And I say street hockey because not everybody knows what street hockey is. It's hockey in sneakers with an orange ball that's really hard and plastic. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so we, we played street hockey, we played baseball, football, I'd play handball. That means you just got a little ball and you whack it against the wall. It's kind of like okay, okay. racket the ball without the racket. Um, I got you. And uh, so those are the sports you played because, you know, you did it in a community setting. And then basketball was the last sport that I decided to play, and it was the one that I fell in love with. So I started playing hoops at about 13 years old. But you mentioned that my family situation, you know, as bad as it was back then – um, my mother never made it seem like it was all that bad. You know, I, we didn't have anything, but she always made me feel like I had what I needed. And uh, when I look mm -hmm. back and think about that. So she did work multiple jobs and uh, her and my dad just, you know, they didn't get along, so they split. Yeah. So that kind of left yeah. me just uh, playing sports, which really saved me. And uh, I had some great friends and I had a sister who was older. So, um, you know, I, I just, I always say the zip code I came from, I should have never got out of there. Wow. Um, we, you know, it, was, it, was a part yeah. of, it was a part of Boston that was Italian heavy. And back then in Boston, all the different, you know, towns had their own uh, ethnicity. You know, yep. you yep. had the black neighborhoods, you had the Hispanic neighborhoods, you had the Italian neighborhoods, you had the Irish neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every, it was very territorial back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Coach, you talked about your mom having a lot of love. Mine was the same way. She uh, didn't never turned me against my father, who, you know, they divorced when I was about 11 or 12. So I always find that fascinating uh, mother's strength. Uh, and I, I look at it from a black woman's perspective, you from an Italian mother perspective, but there's still that certain level of love. Uh, but the thing is, keeping us from getting into those streets, because I know that's a big thing when I look at some of the guys when I go back home, probably for you the same way. Sports kept me away from that. How did that do that for you as well? Oh, real easy. I mean, I played outdoors, right? Everything was outdoors, indoors. And some of my friends would not – you know, they didn't pick up basketball. They played other sports, and some of them decided not to play sports. So if you're not playing sports, you know, back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, then what are you doing? You're hanging out. You know, if you're hanging out, you know, there's going to be things happening that shouldn't be happening at, at 18, 19, 20 years old. So being on a basketball court and then going home after uh, helped me avoid those situations early on, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16 as I mentioned, up to 18, 19, uh, it, and it, it, it gave me a goal to do something on a daily basis. And like I said, I fell in love with basketball, and, and, and you know, I'm still loving it today, and, and we're talking about it. So it's, it's been my saving grace in my life beside, you know, my faith and my family. Well, you, you love football, too. So I'm sure you played all sports growing up, you know, football, basketball, street hockey. You know, what, what was it about – the game of basketball 
that got you so entranced and in love with the competition, the, the, just all the X's and O's, because when you coach, you have to be dialed in. But when you recruit, you have to be dialed in. When you're, when you're learning the game of basketball, what was it about the game of basketball that you just said, I, I love this game? You know, when I just went to the court and shot the ball, when I saw the ball go through the net, it excited me. So I wanted to do it again and again and again. And so you sit there and you shoot for hours. And every time you miss a shot, you want to go back and make the next one and you move around on different spots. And I used to play that. You remember growing up that hot shot game, uh, yeah, hot spot. Yeah, yeah. You shoot from, yeah. you know, the block, the first line, the second line, the elbows, and you get points for each spot. So, you know, I challenged myself on the court. But it was the fact of making a shot and then wanting to do that again the next day, then eventually I started to play the game, not just shoot. And, uh, you know, I started to love it even more. And I guess I became pretty good at it at a young age. And anytime you're good at something, I think it makes you want to come back and try it more. So uh, I love to see the ball go in the net. I enjoyed playing. And then I became, you know, decent at it. Yeah. The, the couple of things that struck me and in, in just kind of doing some research about you, you said you didn't really get to play till your senior year, like in, in college. You, you played in, in you, you played in high school. You you, you walked on at Salem, uh, is it Salem State or Salem College? Uh, yeah, and State. Tom, yeah. T- yeah, Salem State. Tom Thibodeau was a senior when you were a freshman, but you 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 got hurt. You get you just kept coming back. Tell us about that because I, I love the the stick tuitiveness and all the things that you had to do to get. To, to get to become a senior captain. I think people just see that and they don't realize all the struggles that you had to go to get to that point. Yeah, it really is, um, or was. I'm a freshman uh, at Salem State. I come out of high school at a local Catholic high school called Pope John. I was the captain of the team. I was a starter, but I was an average player on an average high school team. <laughs> so I wanted to get recruited so bad, right? And, and I laugh when I say that because you and I did Recruiting Nation for like a decade at ESPN. And all I wanted to do was get recruited out of high school. Didn't happen. So I decided to go to Salem State and, and be a walk-on. Well, as you know, when you're a walk-on, you invite yourself to the party, right? You invite yourself to tryouts. <laughs> and so I got cut. And I, I was devastated, Buck, when I got cut. I mean, I was I – was, I, I don't know – Depressed is the right word, but back then I felt it because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's what I wanted my whole life, and it didn't happen. So, uh, But the great trait that I did have was persistency. So I decided to dedicate you know, the whole year to getting in better shape, becoming a better player, change my body. So I try out the second year, and in tryouts, I come down on someone's foot, break my ankle. Oh, oh man. So I'm over for two. Meanwhile, financially – I'm poor and broke. So my mother's telling me, you got to get a job. You know, what's, what's this <laughs> basketball stuff? And I says, mom, I got to, I got to make this team. That's my goal. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she didn't understand. She's working two jobs and she wanted me to work. And I did work odd jobs, but I never got a full-time job because my full-time job was yeah. basketball. I play it morning, noon, and night. So finally my third year, I, I make the team. Um, and then in my senior year, Tom Thibodeau is the head coach. And I think he just valued what I brought to the team, which was, you know, Buck, I brought a great passion. I, I brought an intensity level that mm-hmm. nobody else would have a greater level of intensity than I would. That was my goal. I became yeah, yeah. a smart player. I, I developed a basketball IQ. Uh, I knew practice was my games. And so I treated it that way. So I think I brought the team a work ethic. I brought the team an intensity level. I was a great teammate, you know, not just in practice. I try to make you better if I went against you. I didn't try to make you look good because you were the starter. You know, I didn't try to hook up my boy. I try to make you better. It's like, oh, oh, oh no, no, no. I, I would harass you in practice oh, and then I'd love you, you and I'd love you after practice. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I was a good teammate. Uh, I knew my role. I played it well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it, it was such an, you know, a fulfilling moment for me when I was named captain of the team because I had, you know, not my wildest dreams that I ever think I'd be a captain in college. But my leadership intensity and persistency uh, and being a great teammate led to those things that Tom Thibodeau valued back then 
and now look where he is in the NBA. So yeah. you put a premium on the traits, and, and that's how I made mm. it. Well, I'm always fascinated, too, about the progression afterwards. I know you were GA, but when you were a coach at the eighth grade CYO team, I mean, you said you probably had the most fun doing that. I mean, I know the GA role, getting you to Boston College. Mike, I mean, you coach with some guys like Mike Jarvis, Rick Majerus. I mean, there's a lot of guys that you coach and played for. But tell us about your experience coaching eighth grade CYO basketball, because I've done that before. I got a daughter. And, I, and my son, and CYO basketball is one of the most competitive, <laughs> especially in a town like Boston or wherever, wherever you were living at the time. Those parents get after you. Tell us about your, your, your experience as a CYO basketball coach. <laughs> well, I'm playing high school ball. When I played high school ball at Pope John, I knew I wanted a coach. Yeah. So what I did on Saturdays, because we would have Saturdays off, is I would coach CYO basketball. And we practiced once a week. And then we played on Saturdays. And uh, you're right, it was really competitive. Um, and, you know, where I grew up, it was like in my Italian district, it would be like, you know, St. Saint Vinny or St. whatever we were, right? <laughs> We'd go play St. Yeah. Rita, St. Mark, yeah. and all these different towns. And it was, a, it was very competitive. And you, you oh, would yeah. think it was high school ball. Uh, but it, it, it was my first time coaching. And I'll tell you what, man, I just got, I got hooked. It was like a drug. I couldn't yeah. stop. I just, I love being with kids. I love, you know, coaching them during the game. I love trying to see if I can make them as competitive as I was, try to teach them the game, uh, develop a, a bond between them because I'm a senior in high school and they're eighth grade. So it was a lot, a lot of fun. And it's the first time I've ever had a chance to, to coach a team. And uh, it, it's just, it's where every coach should start is that, you know, the, the lowest level, because when you start at the bottom, I started at the bottom in my playing career and in my uh -huh. coaching career. And I'll just yeah. give you a side, side bit about Tom Thibodeau. You know, everybody says he's this great coach, right? He can take players and make them better. But, you know, Buck, I didn't make the NBA, so he can't be that good of a coach. <laughs> Who was the father figure or the coach that stepped in? Because generally – that's where our influences are. It's either going to be the street. It's going to be the, uh, the guy that you see on the corner. It's going to be somebody. But who was that coach for you that made a big difference? Yeah, you're 100% right. It's who's ever in your life. So if you're playing ball, it's your coach. Mm -hmm. So before high school, I played CYO ball at um, the local church mm -hmm. called St. Lazarus. And so my, my okay. CYO coach, I remember his name to this day, Vinny Capozzi, another paisan. And, you know, Vinny, Vinny was our coach, and you did what Vinny said. And Vinny was yeah. – he was a tall guy. He was 6'6", six, six, uh, and he played small college ball, and he was my coach in the seventh and eighth grade. And, and then as I went into high school, I, I took over the team. And uh, then my high school coach was so instrumental because, as you said, you're void of a male figure in your life. So I spent the most time in basketball. So my high school coach was the guy who I became closest with. And uh, he, he was fantastic. Yeah. He was a teacher at school. And basketball was the hook, right, for us to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And then we would get into other subjects, whether it was academics or, you know, social life or things that you got to stay away from as a young man. And uh, I think my mom and him had a lot of talks. And I think he knew that he was somebody who uh, had great influence over me and tried to be a, a very good role model. And he was. And uh, so yeah. I, I credit my CYO coaches my high school coach. And then obviously, you know, I spent a lot of time with Tom Thibodeau because he was the assistant coach for a couple of years. Then he became the head coach. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting to hear those names and Mike Jarvis. I've always been an admirer of, of him from a distance. I don't know Mike, but I like how his teams play. You got the opportunity to be a GA on his staff. And then you went to Brown, I think after that, but tell us about working with, with coach Jarvis and what he was like to you. Uh, giving you an opportunity to coach in Boston and, you know, being at home and having an opportunity to coach at the college level. It was so exciting. I, I graduated from Salem State and I coached at Salem State for a couple of years. A Tom Thibodeau left. I coached with another gentleman by the name of Dana Skinner. Dana was a, a great oh, player. You know yeah, Dana Skinner, yeah. that name? I remember that name, yeah. yeah. He was a great player out of New England. And he actually was on the Celtics for a while. 
coached with him, and then I went to another Division three school called Suffolk University uh, with a gentleman by the name of Jim Nelson, who's maybe one of the most respected coaches in all of New England basketball. Uh, he's retired now. So I got great mentors, and then, you know, I, I begged Mike Jarvis to be his volunteer coach. I mean, oh, that's wow. what I did. So I'm, I'm 26 years old. I'm still living at home. You know, coaching Division three ball, you're just – you're, I'm substitute teaching during the day in the Boston public school system and I'm coaching at division three. Then I go to BU and I beg coach Jarvis to be the volunteer. And uh, he was gracious enough to take me on. I, you know, I showed him that persistency, that, that willingness to do any job imaginable and the passion for the job, you know, and, and he taught me so much about the little things, the big things. And you're right. He was fabulous to be around. He treated people so well whether it was his players or people at, at Boston University. And he was a really smart coach. And Buck in practice, man, he was a tough dude. Like, he would get on those guys. And, you, you know, when he got on them back then, you got a little nervous because he, he had a fire about him. But he was really intelligent. And then off the court, you know, he was just a total gentleman. And, mm -hmm. and he's the guy, Buck, who took me from Division three to Division mm -hmm. one now. now there was no pay involved. When I said there was nothing, but I'll tell you what he did. You know, obviously he tried to feed me whenever we could. Uh, and I would show up to Boston University about 2, 2.30 every day after teaching school till 11 o'clock at night. And then mm. I'd be there on the weekend. So uh, at the end of my first year with him, and I only spent one year, but he took care of all my travel and he got me tickets mm. to the Final Four in 1989. Um, oh, that was my cool. reward. That was my pay. It was, uh, that was my first final four because of Mike Jarvis. I couldn't oh, afford to, God. I couldn't afford to fly there. I couldn't <laughs> afford, I couldn't afford anything. Couldn't afford the ticket. He, yeah. he bought it all for me and said, here, thank you. And I, I'll never forget that. That's good stuff. Well, we're going to take a short break. We'll come right back. We're chopping it up with Buck and coach Paul, me and Park, Paul, me and Cardi. We'll be right back. Many people are looking for natural alternatives to help ease their aches and pains. Begin stopping the pain with the help of Pain Stopper. Formulated by healthcare providers, Pain Stopper helps alleviate a variety of physical ailments so you can get back to doing what you love. Our products are triple independently lab tested to ensure the highest quality hemp available. Visit PainStopCBD.com for more information. Pain Stopper, because why manage pain when you can stop it? At Heslip Wealth Advisors, our goal is to help small businesses develop quality retirement plans for their employees through our Lunch and Learn seminars. We provide lunch and learning tools to help your company succeed and unmatched customer service. All right, we're back with Coach Paul Biancardi. And, you know, Coach, I call you Coach because everybody does, right? When you become a coach, that's the, the mantra that you get. So you talked about Mike Jarvis before the break. The one guy I'm really interested in and in, in hearing more about is Rick Majerus. I mean, I've heard so many stories about Coach Majerus. Now, you were at Wright State coaching. You were a head coach. And then you, um, you know, things happened there and you, you had to leave. Uh, or you, you chose to leave Wright State. Tell us a little bit about the transition from leaving Wright State and then going to work with uh, Coach Rick, Rick Majar, Majerus. Excuse me. Yeah, Rick Majerus at that time, Buck, was, you know, an iconic figure. Uh, he was, no pun intended, larger than life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As he would say, he would never be a, a 42 regular on a suit jacket. Um, yeah. But one of the great teachers of the game, I got a team in Utah to the 98 championship game against Kentucky and almost pulled it off. He was on his way to the, I believe, the Hall of Fame until his death. Um, yeah. you know, about five or six years, seven years after St. Louis. But I was done at Wright State and uh, looking for a job. And uh, Rick Majerus just got the St. Louis job. But the way we connected was so cool because everybody says it's all about relationships. Well, it, it's about meeting people, treating people well, and, mm -hmm. and with respect and kindness. So my assistant coach, his name was Brian Donaher. His dad was Don Donaher, the longtime famous head coach at Dayton. So him and Rick Majerus are great friends. 
I'm a head coach at Wright State. Rick Majerus working at ESPN at the time. That's right. He, yeah. yeah. He comes into Dayton and says to Don Donaher to visit Don Donaher, and he says, hey, uh, I want to go over and see Wright State practice where your son is. Call that Ben Cardi guy and see if I can get in. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you can get in. So not only did he come in, but he comes in with a yellow pad of paper. Mm -hmm. I never met him before. He goes, hey, I just want to watch practice. I'm going to take a few notes. I'm like, okay, I don't know what you're going to – you're probably going to learn what not to do, not what to do. <laughs> I mean, I, I was nervous because here's Rick Majerus watching my practice and taking notes. I asked if he would talk to the team after uh, and just send a message, which he did. He was very gracious. Uh, so that's how we met. He came to practice. Practice was over. Uh, he told me what he saw in practice, spoke to the team. Of course, we went out and got something to eat. That's part of the ritual. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so we, we met then, we hit it off then, and then, you know, three or four years later, he's, he's got the St. Louis job, and I'm looking for a job, and he hired me. Now, Coach, what would you do differently if you could go back to Wright State? What would, it, what would be different for you if you, could, if you could do that all over again? Um, you know, just in terms of being a head coach? Yeah, what would you do differently as a head coach and just the, the whole experience? Yeah, you know, I, I felt that I was really well-groomed, uh, Buck. Mm -hmm. I spent 14 years, seven at Boston College, six at Ohio State. We had some really great years, uh, Elite Eights, Final Fours. But you know this, you, no matter how much you prepare for something, you're never ready for it until you step yeah. into that role. I think one thing I would do is probably delegate a little bit more. I think when you're a first-time head coach mm – -hmm. You know, you want to control every decision yeah. that goes on in your program and, you know, things that don't have to do with winning. You know, what color uniforms uh, do you want mm -hmm. to pick out? Uh, just things that really don't have a, a, a big uh, difference in your program. I, I was so uh, attention to detail that I wanted to be involved with every decision of everything. And it's so exhausting. So yeah. I hired a great staff. I should have delegated a little bit more. Uh, if I ever do it again, I would definitely be able to delegate more so because that frees you up as a head coach to make those really big, important decisions and put your focus where winning matters most. Yeah, and you talked about the Ohio State experience. I didn't want to gloss over that, but I know you had a really good run there as well. And, and all of those things seem to prepare you for the coaching side, but also now in recruiting. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you're at that level, you consider yourself a good evaluator, but – Mm -hmm. When I got to ESPN and, and took that position of the recruiting director, which Tom Luganbill has for the football side, all we do is evaluate prospects and we put them on a big board. And um, I thought I was a good evaluator then. I'm, I'm actually so much better today as I mm -hmm. was back then because that's all I do uh, for the most part, 24-7, is watch players either live or on film and, and break down their, their tendencies. So being at Ohio State, being at Boston College, being a head coach at Wright State, St. Louis, it really helped me get the job. That resume in the game mm -hmm. helped me tremendously when I applied for the job. And um, it's funny how I got the job, Buck. My college teammate at Salem State was neighbors with the person who was making the decision. <laughs> oh, wow. So you, again, again, you talk about relationships. So yeah. Me, yeah. me and my guy, right, me and my boy were teammates – and we're friends for 20 years. The job came open. I was talking to him about it. And he goes, that's my neighbor. My neighbor's making that decision then. Let, let me talk yeah. to him. Wow. So it, it, not, and I treated that, uh, my friend, you know, he was younger than me. So it was like my little brother that I never had. And 20 years later, uh, the blessing came back. Now, you know, the one thing that we also have to talk about with COVID and everything else, we've seen all the, the things that have happened. Uh, the NBA just the other day, you know, just basically postponing and canceling games because of the situation in, in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin. You know, before that, the George Floyd incident in Minneapolis. How would you, as a, as a coach now, and even now when you talk to some of these kids, how do you have those conversations with some of these young men that are struggling because a lot of the kids in, in basketball are, are people, kids of color. They're, the kids are African-American kids. They grew up in the streets, maybe not in the place where you grew up, but something similar. How do you, how would you juxtapose those things now with these kids when you talk to them now, or if you were a coach currently? 
That's a great question. Uh, first of all, I, I had to get more educated myself. Uh, yeah. I, I can sit here and say a lot of things that have already been said uh, that are good things, but they weren't good enough. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you know me pretty well, so you, you know my background yeah. now and, and you know me, but uh, you know, saying that you're not a racist and saying that you have black friends doesn't mean anything. Yeah. I thought it meant something, but it doesn't. Um, so the only thing that I would want to do is educate, which I have myself over the course of time since this, this has begun, and then I would take that education and transfer it to, to our players if I was coaching a team and really dive deep into the history of racism, dive deep into what respect really means and how important it is to move forward in your life. Uh, I try to give them as many lessons as I can about racism, respect, and, and, and just being a good human being. Uh, yeah. Basketball, getting back to those days that you brought me back to, you know, I'm on the court and, you know, I know this guy's black and this guy's Puerto Rican and, and this guy is, is, is another race, but I didn't see that as a basketball player. You were either on my team or you're on the other team. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so basketball uh, really, really uh, never let me see color. It never let me see uh, ethnicity. It never made me see rich or poor. Uh, it's one of the beautiful things that basketball did and sports can do for somebody is because, you know, when you're on that football field, you're with your brothers. Yeah. I'm on the basketball no, I, I, I'm with my guys. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. see anything but my guys. And I guess the thing is when you, you know, growing up in Boston, Boston's had some history of, of, of racial inequality and some racism. How did you square that up when you went home and talked to people? Because you had been out recruiting in people's homes with parents and kids that you got to know and love and have, like, these were your kids. Yeah. But if you heard something uh, that you knew wasn't right, how did you square that up or how did you approach that? Yeah, when I grew up, I mean, there was race. I mean, it, there's been racism for hundreds of years, but it, all yeah. the stuff that's been happening in our society currently, it mm -hmm. made me think back to when I was a kid and, and how evident racism was back then. And yeah, basketball was great. It didn't allow me to see it, but I knew it was there. Yeah, um, yeah. And then as you go on and you – get into your profession. Um, you learn that it was, it was bad back then. And you, you try to teach the guys that you're coaching to never see color and to always treat people with love and respect and kindness. And, you know, on the basketball court, you got to be one way, you know, but off the basketball court, you got to be this way on campus, this way in society. And someday you're going to have a job and a family. So I was constantly trying to, to help our kids see the big picture in, in everything that, they were going through and you know boston college is a place where uh, predominantly it's white so yeah. we had some black kids from detroit and they didn't feel very comfortable <laughs> there but you know I, understand. I, understand. We brought them, I brought them around the city downtown showed them that there was plenty of, of people that were black and of different races as well because it's a very international city as yeah. you know yeah yeah so, it is it is so you know, I, I've always just tried to educate whoever I was coaching, recruiting, or trying to give advice to, and I was trying to always give the right message and, and look at the big picture. Yeah. So one thing I wanted, if we change gears a little bit, when you think of the AAU circuit, right, it, what can be done in that area? Because as good as it is, and you and I have talked about this before, but I, I know you have some great thoughts on it. What can help change the culture of AAU to, 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 to make it, I, I don't even know the word to use, but just make it better. Like even now, like the health and safety is not as, as targeted as it should be. There are things that are happening in that environment, but there's so many other things that you can look at. It's great because these kids get exposure, they get a chance to play, but there's so many kids that don't make it in the AAU culture. What, what are your thoughts on that and how would you uh, change it? Or what are some of the things you thought, hey, this could be better for our, for our, for our game? Well, first of all, it'd be great if they could practice more because they don't get a lot of time to practice before games. That's why the games, when you go there as coaches or evaluators, you see it's kind of raggedy. Well, they don't get a lot of chance to <laughs> practice. And, and they're, take, they're usually taking the best guys from different programs and putting them on a team. So you don't have a lot of chemistry. You don't have chemistry sometimes. Uh, you don't have practice. And so the games don't look as organized or as intense maybe as a high school game. And speaking of intensity, 
you know, the summer basketball circuit has, has blossomed so much over the years that sometimes kids could play two games a day, three games in a day. And I think that really hurts uh, their competitiveness. It's great that they love it and they want to play, but when you're playing that first 30, you know you got another game at 2 o'clock, so losing doesn't hurt as much. Uh, when you play a high school game on Tuesday night, you don't play yeah, again until yeah. Friday. So it, it, there's a greater meaning in my mind. Not that it means more, but it's just you don't get that chance to get that game back. And you guys in football are a great example. Mm -hmm. Play once a week. <laughs> now, now, you know, when you talk about your transition from coaching to ESPN, tell us about that because I think people always think, you, you, you finish playing, and then they just – you walk right into the booth. How was that for you, and what did that look like, and how did it all come about? Well, again, I was coaching at St. Louis with Rick Majerus, and the job opened up. A friend of mine from college was, was friends with the person doing the hiring. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So I fit a profile of a coach. They wanted a, somebody who coached at the high majors or was a head coach. So I had both of those parts of my resume. Uh, but I wasn't really looking to leave. I loved being with Rick Majerus at times. He could be very combustible. He could be very <laughs> combative. Uh, and, and at times he could be very caring too. Um, but I didn't have any um, feeling to leave. You know, I wanted yeah. to be a coach again or, or stay as an assistant. But when I got offered the job, it was a ground floor. They just started this in basketball. Uh, Tommy Luganbill had the football job. And yeah, was, yeah, yeah. It was a pretty big job they put together at the time. Looked at it, thought about it, uh, talked to my wife about it, and even talking to Coach Majerus, he said, hey, you can come back and be an assistant coach anytime you want in the game. But this may be an opportunity, may never come again. So he, he actually opened my eyes to it a little bit more, uh, decided to take it, and uh, here I am today talking to you. And it, it's opened doors for me. It, it's had me meet incredible people that you and I have both met at ESPN, yeah. me meeting you. Uh, I consider you one of those people that is like, I'm so happy and proud to have known you then yeah. and now. I mean, we develop a relationship that would have never happened. I mean, ESPN opened a lot of doors for me, just meeting people. I got to tell you though, I mean, you understand this being a, a former great player. Uh, corporate America was at my speed when I walked through the door though. <laughs> it, it was it was too you know us coaches like things you know black and white yeah, right yeah, uh, yeah i don't like it gray and i don't like double talk and i don't like <laughs> politics uh so i had to work my way through those weeds the first couple of years hey, hey coach b has there ever been anybody that you've had as a producer or a, a director or even i know bud morgan helped me tremendously but but who has helped you uh, develop on that side? Because it's a different technique and style you have to develop. No question about it. Yes, you, you never got straight answers because uh, <laughs> it's corporate America. But, uh, but yeah. I broke those barriers down with the people that I worked with and it, it became a, a you know great relationship. Yeah, I, I had Bud Morgan as well. He was fabulous. Um, oh. The first time he critiqued me, uh, he ripped me so hard. And he went through all the negative things. <laughs> Same thing, right? And I'm sitting, there, I'm sitting there with a pen and paper, and I'm writing it down, you know, taking notes. And I'm saying to my – as I'm writing, I'm saying, I got no shot in this profession. I'm not going to make it. <laughs> then he paused, and he said, but you can be very good, you know. And so, yeah, you know, that broke good. voice. So he, he broke you down. He built you up almost like a coach. Um, yeah. Yeah. He, very, yeah. He was very helpful back then. Dan Steer, uh, who once – came over at ESPNU. I was friends with him from when I was coaching. He was very good to me. Uh, Sean Murphy, who's there today, mm -hmm. has really taken time uh, away from his job to, to give me some really uh, great feedback and, and great advice about being an analyst. So I think those guys have really spent time trying to make me better, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. I think when you have those guys and you really talk to them and tell them, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Because sometimes they don't know because I think they've had folks that don't understand hard coaching or coaching from that standpoint. And when you, you – know, I know Murph and uh, JV and all those guys, when you tell them, hey, this is what I need, and then they send you to Bud, and Bud makes you write, like, on your yellow notepad, <laughs> five pages of notes, and then at the end he will tell you, but, hey, I think you can be good at this. And it just, I, I agree with you. It, it's so nice when you have somebody that's honest with you 
but they also have your best interests. And I think that's what the, what we like as being players, but also as coaches as well. No question. You know, now, Coach, tell me this. When you, when you look at today's coach and you look at today's player, what are the couple of things that they need? I know one thing I've heard you say is be a listener. Coaches, when I grew up, you just they just told you what to do, and you didn't have this whole I got to tell you my side of it. It's okay. I want to bust him in his face, but I'm going to do what he says. And then afterwards, he may love on you. But it ain't going to be love right there. It's going to be tough love. What do the players, like from your perspective, now that you're out talking to these players, you see these players, what is it that they need? Or what is it that you would have to do as a coach to be better as far as a listener and whatever else, other uh, things you'd have to do? I think uh, we're in Generation Z right now. Uh, and that's to the adolescent. I think for all coaches, to coach today's player, uh, you have to care as people before you can coach them as players. And I think that's so important. Now, a lot of coaches say they understand that, but you just can't care on the surface, Buck. you you got to dig deep inside to their background, their family, um, everything and anything you can know about them. I think that's how you get to coach today's player. you got to care before you coach. It's about relationships. You build that trust, which builds belief. And then the results, you know, for the court or the the field come after that. Uh, As a coach, I think you have to break down the why today. Like you said, Mm -hmm. coaches back in the 70s and 80s, maybe even early 2000s, you know, do what I say, you know, don't do as I do. And, uh, you know, it's, it's my way or you're taking the highway. Well, today, if you have that approach, you're going to be taking the highway as a coach. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you have to tell them what to do, but you have to break down the why. Because Generation Z today, when they look at us, me and you, and anybody else that's an adult, they're asking themselves, who is this person? What's his credentials? So you have to give them the why and then show them how to do everything. And I think coaches, you know, in the past might have just said what to do. They might not have broke down the why, taken the time to do that, may, maybe not show them how to do it. And, and maybe they cared, but they didn't show that they cared. And you've got you to take action as a coach and really invest your time in caring about your players. And that's how you get the most out of them. Because if you don't, they're going to hit that snooze button on you. And once they hit that snooze button, the players, you lose your team. You've done games. You see a team get blown out, and you say to yourself, how did that happen? The talent's pretty equal. You know, well, did, it, did they not play hard? No. They, they're shut off from their coach. They, they hit the snooze button. Yeah. Once, once the relationship is not there anymore, kids aren't going to play. T- tell me one of your better recruiting stories, or a couple of them, where you had uh, a kid that, you, you know, you had to – it was hard to get to, first off. Secondly, you got him to your place. It, it might have been a little rocky to start, but you were able to see this kid – graduate, go on, to have major success in either basketball or a whole other sport? Yeah, I think the best uh, story I'll tell you real quick is I'm the head coach at Wright State. I get the job in April. Uh, I go right to Detroit, which I had great success in. Um, we had a young man by the name of Howard Isley play for us at Boston College. He played in the NBA for a while. Now he's Jawan Howard's assistant. So I recruit this kid, Deshaun Wood. He becomes the – the best freshman in the Horizon League. And four years later, he became the player of the year in the Horizon League. And I landed him late in the signing period uh, because he didn't have his academics in order. But, uh, you know, evaluating him when I was at Ohio State helped me when I got the right state job because I knew he was available. And I also developed relationships with people in Detroit that said, hey, as soon as I got the job, they said, you got to recruit Deshaun Wood. He's available, and he's one of the best players in Detroit. So, again, the way you treat people, it comes back to you sometime in your life. It may not come back right away. Um, And, you know, we've developed a great bond. His mother died uh, during his four years. And can you imagine how, uh, you know, to coach a player, his mother passes, and and then, you know, you're trying to help him graduate. You're trying to help him get back on track basketball-wise. That's what a lot of people – fans that boosters don't understand what it's like to be with your players day to day you know it's not just practice and go home yeah no i mean that's and that's a great story tell now 
who was the one that made the decision? Because I always know I've heard it's the mom, the grandmother, or, or, or the, the, the matriarch of the family generally is the one that has the sign off to say, yeah, the dad will do a lot of talking, but the moms usually are the ones that say, what's the best meal you had? Or one, you probably had so many of them. But tell me about that, because you can go in anywhere, Coach. I know you can talk to them and feel comfortable, and they'll feel comfortable with you. I, I love to hear those stories about recruiting and getting to the mother of this kid or getting to the grandmother and getting them comfortable with sending their child to you. Yeah, uh, with Deshaun, it was actually – Deshaun made his own decision in many ways. Okay. His mother and father were not together, um, and his dad just really approved him making the decision to come to Wright State. So I, I knew there was no um, – Button pusher, as okay. I was going to say, that nobody was going to push the button. It was Deshaun making up his own mind. And uh, so that you, you have to know that going into recruiting. Who is the person around the prospect that is going to be the most influential? Because you're right. It could be a mom. It could be a dad. It could be a grandmother. Uh, there's, mm -hmm. there's always somebody in that recruiting circle. And I like to call that circle the 360. You, you better know everybody who's around that prospect. Um, <laughs> I recruited a young man by the name of Scooney Penn. Uh, okay. he, he was great for us at Boston College. When we went to Ohio State, he came with us, led us to a Final Four. He's now coaching uh, the Memphis Grizzlies. Now, Scooney, you had to know that his mom was instrumental in his life, but his grandmother had to approve everything. And so mm. I spent probably more time with his grandmother than I did with his mom because his mom was working all the time. She was a single mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Grandmother yeah. – his grandmother was around all the time, so she was the one who was so influential with Scooney. He would even say, you know, I really want to come here, but you you got to convince my grandmother that Boston College is a good place. And, and we went to Ohio State, and he came with us, uh, and he was the a Big Ten Player of the Year. He was, how about this one, Buck? He was the Rookie of the Year in the Big East, and he transferred yeah. to Ohio State, and he was the Big Ten Player of the Year. Pretty good career. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty good. Now, Coach, they always say a coach's wife is the one that makes them. I know, you know, if, I've heard you talk about your wife and your, your family and your kids. I know you're, you're really close. But what's, what's the, what difference has your wife made on you throughout the course of your coaching career and now raising a family? I think it's always fascinating when you've grown up with your mom as a, as a single mom and then you, you don't really know how to raise kids. You don't have a book, just like anything else our wives seem to bring out that the best in us if we allow them to. Tell us about that relationship with your wife and how that's helped you become a better coach, a better person, a better, you know, Christian, all those things that, that we strive for. Yeah, she's done all those things. And it, the way we met is really another great story. I'm, I'm the grad assistant at Boston College. Uh, again, I have no money, right? I'm 28 years old. I owe about 20 grand to credit cards. Oh man! I'm going, I'm going to school full time, and I'm coaching in the Big East, though, and I'm, okay. I'm like I'm living off adrenaline. So, needless to say, didn't have any social life. So, my wife at the time when I was at Boston College, she was the head coach of the women's soccer team. Oh, okay. So she okay. was single. I'm single. We're in those athletic department meetings. And so, you know, we, we noticed each other and uh, we had some coaching friends put us together. And yeah. uh, it, it was, it's an unbelievable story. So we meet at Boston College, we got engaged, we got married and we had our first child and we're both coaching at Boston College. I'm, I'm with basketball for seven years. She's the head women's soccer coach, uh, engaged, married and, and had our first child. It was an awesome experience. Uh, one that, you know, we both cherish to this day. And she comes from a small a town. I don't even know if it's a town, but it's a small area <laughs> in Texas. But she, she grew up on 800 acres on a ranch, and I grew up on the inner city. So we couldn't have been any different. Where in Texas? Where it's, did you grow near, up? it's near uh, Hearn. It's near oh, yeah. But it's way it, east. Yeah. <laughs> it's in the middle of – I mean, it's like the witness protection program where she grew up. I mean, it's middle of nowhere. Is it going on I-20 heading out towards the Louisiana border, Louisiana-Texas border out that way, or is it more – We're headed towards Texas A&M. Oh, okay, okay. So you're in Hearn. So you're in between Bryan College Station 
Okay, exactly. Oh man, she's out in the middle, and that's a lot of land out there. <laughs> a lot of land, and and you're right. Everything you said. I mean, I mean, she was really, and you know, I say this all the time. She was a coach, so she understood what I was doing, and um, that helped us be very compatible. And, and you know, we got along so well. We had the same schedule. She understood my coaching career, and obviously, I understood hers. And uh, I think that's what really, you know, put us together and kept us together because, you know, without her, I, I, I would have never been able to, you know, make progress in the coaching profession while being married. She never put any demands on me because every time I had to do something for the program, she understood. She gave up her head coaching job, up her co job at Boston College. So she sacrificed uh, for the good of my um, career and for our family. And, and she definitely made me a better man. Uh, she definitely made me a better Christian. Uh, so in many ways, I hope she's not listening to this because then I'm going to have to owe her. I wasn't trying to get that to happen. But no, but I'm going always... to tell you what, but a professional person, an incredible wife, unbelievable mother. I mean, I, I, God couldn't have blessed me with a better person. That's great. That's great. Well, Coach, what you like to do at the very... Oh, <laughs> I got I got to go to a break. My, my producer is screaming in my ear. So let's go to a quick break. We'll come right back with Coach Paul Biancardi. We'll be right back. <laughs> Many people are looking for natural alternatives to help ease their aches and pains. Begin stopping the pain with the help of Pain Stopper. Formulated by healthcare providers, Pain Stopper helps alleviate a variety of physical ailments so you can get back to doing what you love. Our products are triple independently lab tested to ensure the highest quality hemp available. Visit PainStopCBD.com for more information. Pain Stopper, because why manage pain when you can stop it? All right, we're back with Coach Paul, me and Cardi. Hey, before, while we were in the break, and, and I had was a producer who we both know, but <laughs> well, that's a whole other story. We talked a little bit about this during the break. Your mom's 91. Your dad came back into your life. Mine did as well. And I think that's important to kind of pay off because so often you hear of situations where the, the father never comes back around uh, and there's no reconciliation for, for those parties. But it sounds like with you, you had that. You were able to get close to your father, me as well. Tell us a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Yeah, he left when I was seven. Uh, they split up. And then about mm -hmm. 17, when I was in high school, I started to see him a little bit more often. Um, and then as I got older, um, you know, we, we started to communicate more. But, you know, my mother did a great thing. She never, she never held uh, my father against me or me against my father. She always said, look, we don't get along, but that's your dad. And, uh, you know, she was, she was so good in that respect when I look back at it because a lot of parents – don't do that. You know, they, they've kind of, you know, they do things to maybe pit, pit their child against the other parent. And, and I'm so grateful my mom didn't do that. I don't think any parent should. Uh, my, you know, my dad, a lot of people say, oh, my dad's my best friend. Well, he wasn't. My dad showed me what to do. He didn't. But he showed me what not to do. And, uh, but, but I feel bad for him, Buck, because he never met ever and obviously he never met his own grandfather so how could he be a dad if, yeah. if you don't meet your own dad and you don't learn from him um and you never met your grandfather it's kind of hard to become a father and so uh, yeah. i don't blame him for that at all and it took me a while to understand it and it took me a while and i was i was pretty upset with him right because yeah. he left yeah. when i was young uh but i realized that as i got older and and uh became more experienced in the world you know, we all kind of got together again on a, on a good platform. I always used to see the things, how to not be bitter, but get better. And I think that's kind of how I look at my dad and I's relationship. As we grew older, we got better. There was some bitterness. There was some, you know, and I'm stubborn like him. So I, I know that to a fault. He had his father in his life. So I would, you know, you would deal with that. But I think the best thing is if you can make those relationships and repair those relationships, you get better. And it's not going to be completely... Uh, absolved, but you know, when he left, he, he loved you, you loved him, and that's the most important thing. Hey, no. hey, coach, we do a little thing at the very end called two minute drill, and it's just some quick questions. So, I, I mean, this is a fun part. It's actually football, but we, you're going to score. Uh, so, 
however you want to look at it. Oh, yeah, we always let you score. So here, here's Just my stick question. with the New England Patriots and I'll get it right. <laughs> well, the one, this is going here, to – here's a couple of questions. What, what music do you like? What do you listen to? What's in your Apple music, your device, when, you, when you're jamming, jamming tunes? Fuck, there's nothing in my Apple tunes. I, I, I am literally a basketball junkie. Uh, I listen to music but I don't have it downloaded yet. Okay, okay. But I love, I love music from the 80s and 90s. Okay, yeah, it, it can be a genre because, uh, I mean, I'm kind of like I'm a like disco guy, man. I used to hang out, me and John Travolta at the disco. <laughs> you know, I used, to, I used to wear those, those big bell-bottom pants. <laughs> Are you in the, in the roller rink with the little long-bottom yeah, pants? I was in the disco. Staying alive. <laughs> I love it. Hey, I, I love the disco era, but I'm, I'm an R&B guy, but we, we, can, we can connect on that one. We, we, we hey, can, yeah. <laughs> we can work with it. So X and O-wise, when you're pressing, what, what's the most important part of the press? Uh, pressure on the ball. Put pressure on the inbounder. I think that's the most important thing. And when you trap and you press, don't foul because it negates the whole idea of putting pressure on somebody else. You build them out. One one other thing too, when you look at the day today's game, elbow or a mid range jumpers were key, but now everybody's shooting threes. How do you defend that if you're coaching? And when you talk to coaches now that are really good defenders against the long ball. In today's yeah, I basketball. think you really have to take their airspace away. When you think you're close enough to a shooter, I think you've got to think again and get closer. It's important that you run guys off the three-point line, take their airspace away, and then obviously you've got to protect the rim. I'm still a fan, Buck, of shooting the mid-range jump shot because I know the analytics tell you no, but I also like if you're a good mid-range shooter like Kawhi Leonard and you've got the field goal percentage from mid-range, I still think it's a good play in the game. I agree with you. One, one other thing. Give me two stats that if you win those stats, you win a ball game. Uh, turnovers. If you have less than 12 turnovers, I think you're going to win that game. And defensive field goal percentage, less than 40% for the, uh, for the other team, I think you have a shot. So if you don't make mistakes and you really defend at a high level, I think you got a chance to win every single game. Hey, that's a long mid-range jumper for Coach Paul being Cardi. He gets it done. He scores. We win the ball game. Hey, Coach, it's been great catching up with you. We got to do it again. And I want to do it live. See, this is a whole goal. We do it here where we're at a distance. We're Zooming and all that good stuff. But at some point, chopping it up with Buck, we're going to sit down in a restaurant. If you drink, have a drink of, of choice. But if you don't drink, you can have <laughs> soda, tea, whatever. And we just sit down and do this again because it's so much fun. And I got to pick your brain about basketball because that's the stuff we used to talk about all the time when we sit <laughs> at ESPNU. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for joining us. Buck, thanks for having me. And yes, no excuses. We got to get together live. <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Mike Gardner, founder of Thin Energy, the wellness energy that delivers each and every time. In six weeks that I've been taking Thin Energy, I feel fantastic. I lost seven pounds in the first week. You just squeeze it in, you take a shot, and you're done. I'll get your joints, get you hyped, get you ready. I feel great. Jump on, try Thin Energy. Drink it, live it. Many people are looking for natural alternatives to help ease their aches and pains. Begin stopping the pain with the help of Pain Stopper. Formulated by healthcare providers, Pain Stopper helps alleviate a variety of physical ailments so you can get back to doing what you love. Our products are triple independently lab tested to ensure the highest quality hemp available. Visit PainStopCBD.com for more information. Pain Stopper, because why manage pain when you can stop it? At Heslip Wealth Advisors, our goal is to help small businesses develop quality retirement plans for their employees through our Lunch and Learn seminars. We provide lunch and learning tools to help your company succeed and unmatched customer service. 